Thank you, Judy. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our October lecture on stone, soul, and labyrinth. We welcome back our guest speaker today, Dr. Stephen Parker, a Jungian psychologist from Fairbanks, Alaska. We will hear about his journey of finding soul through art and stonework after trauma. He will show us his co completed and ongoing stonework and the process of building a large sunken stone spiral labyrinth. His illustrated material is anchored in the work of C.G. Jung. This talk is a continuation of the one he gave on, on April of 2021, a video recording of which is available to members upon request. Dr. Stephen Parker has worked for 40 years throughout Alaska presenting on various Jungian topics. He has long maintained a website called jungcurrents.com. He has been working with stone for two decades and built a large stone sanctuary with many features. His work has appeared in the Journal of Psychological Perspectives and was displayed at the Common Wheel in Bolinas, California. Dr. Parker lives in a birch forest in the hills of Fairbanks, Alaska, with his partner, Jungian analyst, Dr. Cornelia Grabinska, and next door to his two grown children, a grandchild and three dogs. Speaking on stones, soul, and labyrinth, welcome Dr. Stephen Parker, a man who can move mountains. So as I was saying, I appreciate the opportunity to present the highlight last year was one of the highlights, or the reception was one of the highlights. Um, so I'm gonna show lots of slides. I, I prefer words, I prefer images to words and rocks to words. So we'll see how, how that goes. So this is a labyrinth from above. And, and this is this presentation is gonna be like a, one of the movies where you sort of see what the ending is first, and then you figure out how the, how the characters got to be there. So this is the end of a long, long process. And you know, so you know what the ending is gonna be. The question is, why, out of all the things in the world, did I end up doing this? Uh, this has been a uh, surprise to me too. And what I have, I've got notes on every page. I'll be flipping pages here a lot. Um, so let me set, location is very important. Place is very important. Uh, the center of, uh, as you can see here, it's the center of Alaska. They call it the Golden Heart because there was gold here and it's kind of the heart of Alaska, kind of a clever name. Uh, North Pole is up here, and there is one road between us and the North Pole, which I like the idea. I really saw that road is there actually because it's you know, kind of hear the wind. You can kind of hear the winds blowing down from the North Pole. You know, Russia is this way, and you actually can see Russia from Alaska from right about here. Uh, but Canada's here, and surprisingly, Hawaii is about straight down. So we're kind of in a good location here. And in one uh, winter when I was one, I wanted to go far, as far south as I could, and I wanted to see where you know, the equivalent of Fairbanks in South America, and I wanted to see where that would be. Well, the equivalent of, South, of uh, Fairbanks in South America, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, is, Paradise, is, is Antarctica. So we're, we are far north. This is a very northern, northern place, and it gets cold and dark. Uh, and this is it for outer space. Uh, you'll notice the spirals here. We seem to have spirals uh, in the area. Okay, so uh, Joseph Campbell said that, um, you know, he said, life is like arriving late for a movie, having to figure out what is going on without bothering everybody with a lot of questions, and then being unexpectedly caught away before you find out how it ends. So again, this is sort of like a movie, and, we're, and, and there are going to be some clues here and, and about that movie that we're in. Hopefully, we'll figure it out somewhat before it ends. And speaking of movies, so in 1986, 1936, uh, the movie Petrified for a play adaptation uh, with Sidney Howard, Betty Davis, and Humphrey Bogart. And, and the basic plot is that um, Sidney Howard, the Englishman, is kind of wandering in the desert, kind of like Jung went to the desert, Jesus went to the desert. And he comes in the middle of nowhere, there's this uh, gas station. With a, with a store, and that's where Betty Davis and uh, Betty Davis is. And in his 
in his backpack. Later in the movie, you find out there's there's only one book in his backpack. And in the backpack of that book is Modern Man in Search of a Soul. Now, this is 1936. This was two years after that movie came out. So Sherrod Anderson really knew what was going on. And this is the, you know, I think Jung's whole search, you know, from the beginning was, you know, the modern man in search of a soul. And I think we all are still at that point. Uh, this was a movie that where Humphrey Bogart got his start. They became, this is when they started having a thing. He was, he was a shadow figure. He's got some nice horns here. It's a wonderful portrayal of an evil, evil guy. And in the movie, in, in, in life as a movie, you're going to find, you're going to come across an ant for men. They're going to come across the animal, anima figure, the kind of lost souls, and maybe the external anima uh, will comfort the person. This is, doesn't work in the long run. So I'm going to kind of jump here now. So my story starts uh, with a dream. And this is the dream. This is uh, about the year 2000, 22 years ago. So I'm, this is five o'clock in the morning. I sit bolt upright in bed. And this is the dream. There is a red airplane with a red four cylinder engine that crashes and burns and there's smoke coming from it and it's on fire and it's very frightening. And a voice in my head says, you have heart trouble. This is five o'clock in the morning. We'll wake up out of a dead sleep, plane crash, red four cylinder engine. Well, um, I check, I said, well, this is interesting. <laughs> so I check with my physician, we do all the tests, find absolutely nothing wrong. And uh, <clears throat> about three months later, I'm, uh, I'm misdiagnosed at Anchorage. And uh, have, my friend says, we'll come to San Francisco, we'll take care of you. And I get there, they emerge, they immediately take me to the surgery. I have a, um, uh, what's called a Widowmaker situation. There's a, my left arterial descending artery is blocked. They put a stent in and I'm okay. Uh, there was a, I, I learned later that I had about a 10% 10, 10 chance of survival. So this to me, it was remarkable that this dream, you know, three months ahead of time knew I was in trouble. And uh, I had never quite really taken dreams quite that seriously before. It also surprised me. It took me two years to realize that a, it, it was a red four cylinder engine that was leaking oil and smoking. Well, the heart's a red four-cylinder engine. So this was an image, a very direct image of the heart. One of the other images in, in further dreams was of a, there was a battle on the, on the Moulin Rouge. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But I learned later Moulin Rouge is a red windmill. So what, what better symbol for the heart than, some kind, than the red windmill? So this has been quite an initiation into the power of dreams for me. So I'm totally stunned by this. I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm athletic. I can't, I mean, I shouldn't have heart trouble at this age. Uh, well, my father did, so maybe I had a problem. So what I decided to do out of the blue was I said, I decided I needed to build a cave. And uh, it was really probably up to that point anyway, was one of the craziest ideas I ever had. I've never built things out of stone or concrete before, but it seemed like, it just seemed like, it was like, again, that intuitive voice that said, you had heart trouble. It said, you need to build a cave. And uh, so we do that, and um, I said, not most doctors would not recommend this as a course of treatment, nor necessarily would I. That after heart problems, you should, uh, you know, lift heavy stones. But in some ways, it was really the right thing to do. That oh, part of it, this whole thing has been a healing journey in terms of just staying, uh, staying healthy and strong because of the heart, because of the work with the stones. And so that made that made me stronger. That helped a lot. So two two years later. I have a second stent. I go to Anchorage. They kind of blow it down there. They probably um, hit an artery uh, and uh, give me, they, I'm in such pain, they give me so many opiates. I go into cardiac arrest, that they, they revive me. And so that scared the hell out of me. Then uh, a year later, I go with uh, another blockage. I still kept having trouble breathing to go down to San Francisco, avoid Anchorage. And um, my Partner Cornelia had uh, been in San, had heard about this uh, the uh, labyrinth of the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, and she, and she said, "Well, why don't we go walk the Grace Cathedral?" And I thought, "Oh, this is pretty silly. How can how's this going to be do me any good?" But surprisingly, when you when I walked the labyrinth, it really was it really helped calm me. It was peaceful. It was special. 
And the way, of course, the way my wife, mind works is say, boy, I got to have one of those. So I came home that summer and got 10 truckloads of stone later, there was a labyrinth. So then um, two years later, about 2005, about, about this time of year in, uh, in Fairbanks, I have a massive heart attack and uh, <clears throat> get evacuated to Anchorage. And um, <clears throat> it's a very, very serious heart attack. You know, part of the um, cardiology mantras is that time is heart muscle. So the more time between your heart attack and the time you get treatment, the more damage there is. Well, well, Fairbanks did not have a cath unit. They didn't have a way to do immediate treatment. They, you know, they gave you uh, clot busters. It took a couple hours before this worked. So I was pretty damaged. I was, I lost half my heart function from this heart attack. Well, this totally scared. This was very scary and depressing. And uh, I didn't know what to do. After about six weeks, I thought maybe I should make some drawings. That's what you can do. Maybe this will help. So I started doing drawings and I would feel a little better after the drawings. And uh, I did about 40 of them. And about a year later, later, another sort of intuitive voice in my head said, well, you should, you should look at all these drawings and write a, write a paragraph or two about what the drawings were about. So I did this, I did 40 drawings and 40 pages. And out of this came a, uh, came a book, uh, Heart Attack and Soul. And, and this is one of my favorite images uh, from the drawing. Last, last talk, I talked a lot more about the eggs that are in the drawing, but we're going to go a different place this time. Um, so the, and the, the, you know, the, the subtitle on this was, of course, the C is a symbol of the unconscious. So in some ways, I'm trying to deal you know, with the huge waves of emotions coming from the unconscious. <clears throat> One of the drawings, I think this is the 13th drawing, uh, was out of a spiral. And uh, I didn't quite know what to make of this. I, I saw a Jungian psychologist, uh, James Norris, and he looked at this. This is what he, of all the images he saw, that I've done, this is what fascinated him the most. And he said, well, this is a, um, it's an initiation. It's an image of initiation. It's, a, it's the space, the spiral is the way in and a way out. Well, I had absolutely no interest in being initiated or being a shaman or anything like this. And it just, you know, to me, it was just an image of being really scared. But it was this, this is when the spiral first showed up in, in the work. And, um, okay. So trying to sort of figure out what to do, I thought I should go to a cabin in uh, Alaska somewhere. I, 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 I was extremely anxious. I was having severe arrhythmias, 10 or 20 a minute. I just wanted a place to calm down and, and collect myself. And I thought I looked, I couldn't find anything that was had solitude in Alaska nearby. So I thought, well, why don't I just build a cabin? So I guess that's the way my mind works. So I built a cabin on our, uh, on our lower part of our property. And uh, this is it in winter. And whoops. Uh, when you have a cabin, it's nice to have a special guard dog. This was Jenna, our chow. Uh, she was a wonderful dog. And, uh, you know, the guardian to uh, uh, the underworld is Cerebus, the dog. So she's, she was kind of a really good, she was a guardian dog very much so. So, Still out of sorts, I didn't quite know what to do with the summer. And for some reason, I thought I needed to I needed to, to put something on the walls in the cabin. And I thought, well, I, I got stones. So why don't I put stones on the wall? So this that summer, I spent fitting stones on the interior of the cabin. And these are all what are called uh, dry stone stacked. They are, um, you don't use mortar. You just put, you put the stones so that they fit, you know, you know, the, you know, they fit uh, just on top of each other without any kind of mortar. You kind of have to put them back a little bit. So almost all this, almost all the work of the stone sanctuary is dry stone, uh, dry stone work. This is one of the walls in the cabin. Um, again, these these are uh, so these are dry. These, these start having some glue behind them. This is a little bit on higher walls. You certainly don't want rocks falling down on you. So part of the, what I realized and, and part of what this whole journey and talk is about is what, what's happening is, is an exteriorization of what's going on in the psyche or what's going, in, what's going on internally. 
And internally, I was dealing with being feeling very fractured, and I was trying to put the pieces back. I realized I was trying to put the pieces back together, literally. And 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 also, I was trying to make a house like an, it was reminded me of the story of the three little pigs. Like you, you don't want a house that can be blown down. You're traumatized. You want to make something very strong and solid. So I was on the inside. You know, I was fractured, and so I had to create. You know, put the frac put the fractured pieces back together. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the um this is one of the first things i did I, what i wanted to show you here is this is this is a so my i call the tractor guy rich to, to build a space for the cabin and he runs into this really hard rock here this fractured schist and he was swearing at it actually i said no leave it it's really good and that was sort of the basis of the start of the stone sanctuary this presence of this of these fractured of the fractured bedrock and so one of the first things i did um was to um, you know, build, I guess I built I probably I built a wall up here and then it looked to me like it needed something on top of it. But I, I go to this river, I go to this place and get these stones and it, they look to me like like fingers. And one of the things that um, uh, Joseph Campbell had said was uh, this is a very famous quote by this is a bless the, you know, the follow your bliss quote, but he said, I even have a superstition that has grown on me as a result of invisible hands uh, coming out of coming all the time. Namely, that if you if you do follow your bliss and put yourself in the kind of track that has been there all your life, so that if you do what you really should be doing, if you, then there'll be sort of these invisible hands that are helping you. And I was so, you know, I really I really felt like that. And so I sort of did this tribute to uh, that there's an invisible hand. It, it's more like a invisible a bear paw of God rather than a hand, but. It certainly fit, but to my surprise, I mean, these were the stones that I had, and these were the stones that you know made their place. Uh, after I built this, uh, this is not photoshopped. Uh, we got the blessing from one of the local spirit animals. They are wonderful creatures here. It's always um, good to see them. I would note that uh, Joseph Campbell. He was so you know people have used that "follow your bliss" as a kind of hedonistic excuse. Uh, you know, well, I'm just following. I just, you know, I really enjoy this hot tub. I think I'll stay in here. And that's not what it's about. It's about following something deeper than that. And he said he he said he wished he had said follow your blisters rather than follow your bliss. I mean, it takes work. Okay. Uh, one of the last images in the book this is a 39 to 40. It is. Um, you know, I, would, I was trying to tell the story, and this is this was sort of what I drew spontaneously, which is a, a red egg with a spiral at the center of it. And this is a quote. Each each of these drawings would along. I would find a uh, quotation that went along with the drawings. And this is the one. This is one from you. It said I cannot prove to you that God exists, but my work has proved empirically that the pattern of God exists in every person, and that this pattern in the individual has at its disposal the greatest transforming energies of which life is capable. Find this pattern in your own individual self and life is transformed. So there is something, this is the energy that comes from being, you know, that's, that's more what Campbell was talking about was, you know, that's where it comes from. You're following, you're, you're connecting with a deeper unconscious level. And if you'll note, this is just a closer up. You, you can see at this, and I, you know, I drew a spiral in this red egg as the last picture in the story. And it's not like I said, well, I think I, you know, I, I, eggs are symbolic of this and spirals are symbolic of that. I think I'll, I'll put that in. This is just what came to be spontaneous. It's not like I was deliberately taking symbols and putting them out there. It's like, it's like the symbols were coming through my unconscious or through me. So and this, uh, this is the last image and, and it's, it, it's been a very interesting foretelling of what else, you know, happened afterwards. Okay, uh, question time. I would appreciate some questions. It's hard to talk just on Zoom here. So people can raise their hand. Judy said people would be shy at first. <laughs> How about, is Mitch Roth there? Is Mitch there? As you see, his, his, can he raise his hand if he's there? There's someone who's seen the work.
I, uh, Judy, I can't, is Judy saying something? I can't hear anything. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we do have one, uh, Janet Hartman Jones has raised her hand. Go okay. ahead, Janet. Okay, um, I just wondered, did you have background or had you read about the labyrinth or had any background in its history before you walked at Grace Cathedral or was it just totally new for you? Uh, absolutely not. I, did, I had not heard about it. I did not know about it. I think one of my wife's uh, partner's clients had walked it or several had and talked about mm -hmm. it, but I had no, no, I actually was born in San Francisco. I love San Francisco, but I had not heard about the labyrinth there. I mean, I heard about the labyrinth that at Crete, of course, I mean, as a, as a, as a story, but I hadn't heard about walking labyrinths as a kind of spiritual ritual, good thing to do to call yourself. So. Yeah, I studied it. Uh, I studied it and walked them numerous times back in the nineties. Uh -huh. And it's always meant a tremendous amount. Walking meditation has always meant a lot. And, um, Lauren Artress at, at uh, Grace Cathedral, when she was the, I think she was the rector there, um, you know, she has a wonderful book and there's, it's a, there's a lot of depth to the, to the idea of labyrinth. And I got to walk the one at the Shark Cathedral. They uncover the chairs once a week. And when uh -huh. I was there, I got to walk it, which was just incredible. Right. And I, I will talk about her uh, a little later on and about the work there. Uh, Jan okay, we have Virginia Barrett. Uh, Stephen, your work is amazing, but how in the world do you lift some of those larger stones? You know, uh, that's a good question that I get. I, I think I have hidden hands helping me. <laughs> uh, I'm a big guy, and, and uh, that's kind of what I'm made to do, I think, is lift heavy things. Not anymore, right? Each stone, every year, the same stone is a bit heavier, so I don't... <laughs> I don't do the heavy stones anymore, um, but it's a, it, you know, if you can do it, it's kind of enjoyable, you know, it's just, it, you know, it beats lifting weights because it's a bit, you know, you move your body in all sorts of ways and it has some thing, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, nobody else. That's it. Okay. Oh, yes. There's Mitchell Roth. <laughs> So this is the first person who's been to the labyrinth or the stone sanctuary. So Mitch, what's your, what was your, if I can, this is me getting asked to ask questions. So Mitch, what, what's your view of this? What, what do you experience there? Um, well, I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing it evolve over time. And uh, I've just been fascinated by the, the way in which you seem to receive in inspiration for what you're going to do next. Um, uh, you know, from your psyche. And to me, this is especially fascinating because I'm more of an engineer. And so uh, I would, if I were going to start with a project like this, it would be, I would want to know how it was going to end up. And that part of you, there doesn't seem to be any design process going on with how this has evolved um, that, that I could relate to as an engineer. Uh, it almost seems like on sort of a, a daily or a weekly basis, um, you have ideas about what's next without knowing where it's going to end. And I'm still not sure that it has ended. Um, <laughs> we haven't talked about that, but uh, each time over the years that I've visited, there's always something new that wasn't I've never heard of before. And sometimes the inspiration seems to come when you go to look for stones and the stones that you find at various places mm -hmm. seem to dictate um, what you're going to do next. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, point. I guess I'm pretty clear. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that really. But the stones, the stones that made the hand. I mean, it's the stones look like the hand, and that's what needs to be made. So it's true. The stones do dictate, and they do sort of uh, set me in motion for what needs to be done. 
And so, yes, it's to me, the process that you've gone through is really fascinating. Um, and it's uh, really special to be able to visit there. And I also know from uh, our association over the years that uh, your own well-being, both psychologically and mentally, is pretty deeply tied in with the work that you've been able to do, the, the physical work, which seems to be inspired from within, but also feeds back and, and helps you physically in any, any number of ways. Right. Yeah, so one of the original questions I asked at the beginning was why, why the labyrinth or why this work? And I think that was part of the in, intuitive um, target. I mean, that was intuitively correct. That what I need that from, I mean, there, there are all sorts of reasons for doing this, for having it done. But one of was my body, my system knew that if I, I really needed physical work to survive. So this has been, you know, this has been very healing on a physical level. There are any number of times I was scheduled, I was scheduled for heart operations and didn't need one because I, my heart was healthier. So any more questions? Yeah, there's Hunter Herman is. Oh, hi, Hunter. Hi, Stephen. <clears throat> Good to uh, connect again. Um, just a, if you could comment on your number one drawing, the spiral went clockwise. You said that was initiation. And number 39 went counterclockwise. Was there a conscious or unconscious? Um, uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll talk about some more, but it was all done unconsciously. I didn't deliberately, certainly, okay. when I, certainly after the heart attack, I didn't draw. My, I was, my hand was in the left. Ursula Gwynn talks about writing with her left hand dragging in the mud. I mean, I was, I wasn't conscious. I wasn't even conscious when I was doing these drawings. So that, so that wasn't so. And, and uh, even with the, with the uh, spiral in the egg, I didn't deliberately put it away. Now, the, and the, the spiral labyrinth, I, I think was, you know, I thought about it and, I, and it just, actually it felt to me that it needed to go to the right. I guess I'll give it, and part of the Jungian interpretation is going clockwise, going counterclockwise is going towards the unconscious and going clockwise right. is towards consciousness. So it makes sense if you're walking in the descending spiral in the, on the descent that you want to go counterclockwise. You want to go into the unconscious and then when you turn, you become more conscious. That's sort of what the path is. Okay. Also, on your paintings, did you paint with your dominant hand or your least dominant hand? I was painting with, I was actually using, it was a computer assisted drawing. I really can't paint, but I can use a computer sometimes. And uh, it was, it was, so it was, it was right handed with a mouse. And you're right handed? Yes. Okay. No, because I, um, I consciously switch left and right um when i paint but or, how, does it make a difference when you're drumming yes because if i theoretically i'm right-handed so my dominant brain is left hand or left-sided and generally i would say i uh, would paint or draw what i think i see and when i switch hands to the the least dominant it's more like i'm drawing what I see rather than what I think I see because it's more direct. That's, that's interesting. But sculpting is really both sides of the hemisphere because it's a three-dimensional process. And that's what you're doing with stones and manipulating uh, mass and matter. But that's a three-dimensional movement. That's a good point. Yeah. OK, so that's let, let me. Uh... It's a good timing here. So let me do a next, the next round and then we'll get to more questions. I, it's really helpful to connect with people as opposed to just talk. So, so the next stage is, so the previous one was, was um, let's see where we are here. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's where, we, so, so we're there. So I'm sitting on a roof, the cabin has a flat, flattish roof. And I'm sitting on the top of the cabin. This is how I sort of did things originally was I would sit in the top of the cabin and just look out, drink some tea or coffee and see what need what seemed seemed to come to mind. 
in the right right side there it looked to me like I needed to put a spiral. And so this is based on that spiral that I had drawn on the eggs. It seemed like a perfect place for it. So this was this was a, you know, all this stuff in many ways this this stone sanctuary developed out of the drawings because those those came and then these things were sort of represented what actually was in these drawings and it seemed like I needed to exteriorize it even more to make it a further development of, of the two dimensional turn the two dimensional into a three dimensional thing. So you all may be familiar with the Fibonacci sequence. This is a Nautilus shell. And um, I'll, sh I'll show you the pattern in a minute here. The, it's, so, you know, um, in 1874, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a poem and, and, and part of it says, build thee, O more stately mansions, O my soul. So this is about the soul being, you know, the soul building milk. Well, you know, if you if you look back in time, in 1874 was about the time Jung was conceived. He was born in 1875. So this is he writes this poem about building more stately mansions on my soul. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty surprising. So this is a Fibonacci sequence, and this 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 it, it may not be clear. I'll show it in a minute. But this is based that that shell is based this, on this sequence, where you take the you take a number and you add it to the number before. So you start with zero, you add one, and one and zero are one. One and two are three. Two and three or five, five and eight or thirteen, and so on. And so you have the sequence, and, and lots of lots of um, things in nature have the sequence. And, and and this is, in fact, it was this Fibonacci in twelve hundred realized this was the sequence when you have two rabbits mating and they have offspring. This is a this is the number of rabbits that you have. So this is also this is more in three D. So so here's one and one. So this is a, this is one square foot. And then one and one or two, it's two. And then you have a five square feet and that's five by eight. So th this is the pattern that happens. And so then if you lay this out on the ground, this is, you know, take many, yeah, this didn't happen the first time, but if you, if you do it right, if you do the measurement right and you'll see the measuring tape here, you, get, you can get the sequence. And I believe, I believe this is actually what it is. This is eight, eight feet. And I think this is 13 feet. This whole labyrinth is 21 feet long. And this is a hillside that originally, you know, it was just there. It was just there, and it, you know, it just seemed like it needed, you know, I guess that it seemed like it needed a labyrinth. So this is so. Lo and behold, I have these big flat stones, and these are mostly uh, bedrock from the property uh, where we were working, and dry stone stacked, of course. And this is this is just you get a sense of, of of how it is in winter. So I built this labyrinth, and then in the middle. It seemed like it needed another stone structure. So this is what I call the cornucopia. It's sort of, a, it's, it's not a spiral, but it's sort of a structure on the inside of the spiral. So these are some of the others, you know, this, this talk is mostly about the labyrinth, but I wanted to give you a sense about what preceded it or how, you know, how I got to go there. Um, this originally in the book, or the drawings are lots and lots of uh, eggs. And this was supposed to be an egg. I think it turned into a little more like a beehive. But again, they're, they're uh, dry stone staff and you can't quite you know, make it perfectly on it. But um, it turned out, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out actually. And uh, in Fairbanks, one of the most wonderful flowers here, here is the iris. And uh, these, are, you know, these are local flowers. Okay, and then another, another um, I call this the egg from entropy. It's like all the, the out, of, out of chaos, out of nothing, which is here and here. These, this is just random stones thrown against the wall, really. And, uh, and out of the chaos emerges the, emerges the egg. Again, no cement was used in this, pro no, in this process. This, is, uh, this, was, again, this was a fireplace. It was going to be a bigger egg, and then it you know, things change as I do it. This, this is my tribute to the burning man. You can kind of see that this is, we have fire in the belly, this is where it is. So we got the legs and the arms and the fire in the belly. Uh, originally, on the, this, is, this is looking south. This is looking south from the stone sanctuary. South is towards you know, Hawaii or the lower 48. And so the south wall in, in, in Alaska, south is like, the magic direction. This is where the sun is, and so south is the very is the most. Everyone wants a place to look south. So I put. I this is this is uh, 
driftwood from the local. We have a big river here, the Tanana River. It's almost the size of the Colorado, I think. Nobody talks about it, about the fifth river, largest river in Alaska. Huge river, even the Fairbanks is kind of avoided because it's pretty, it can be a pretty difficult river, but uh, it's wonderful. It's one of the best places in town, actually, or near town. And you can see the, the um, uh, you know, the, the wood of the, the drift in the background. And this is again, one of the spirit animals. Now, I want to talk to you, when you make a pond here, it's not, you, you use a pond liner, there's not enough clay. So you have to, you know, you put in this, uh, so it's like a, a rubberized polyurethane that you put in and the, and the uh, you, you line the, the ground with it. Well, unfortunately, poles are very, very sharp and they will, I'm sure this was actually punctured the liner on this happy occasion. <clears throat> uh, this is my, uh, again, this is a driftwood uh, looking south. And th this is the, one of the favorite, most favorite things I did here. Uh, this is a heart, this is a heart stone. And then you know, this is to me, I can almost see a creature here holding the, holding the body. I just, it was a nice day. So this was really a, uh, uh, it felt good to have finished this. So part of the, this whole process, and I think Mitch was talking about this, it's there's an exteriorization of what's happening on the inside. So part of what happened is my heart walls were damaged. You know, this is where the problem is from the heart attack. And what I'm doing is trying to strengthen my walls. I'm building up walls, you know, for, for the heart so that they're stronger. Okay, I think there's a break here. Good, it's going faster than I hope. So uh, again, this would be a time for questions. The next, this is this has been the prelude. This has sort of been how, you know, again, this talk is mostly about the spiral labyrinth. But this, I wanted to give you a sense of the work that came before to get a sense of why, you know, how this, how this developed. So in time for any more questions, if there are. Oh, no raised hands right now. Anybody? Wanna... Um, Janet again. Please. Oh, hello again. I don't want to steal your uh, any of your talk, but are you going to talk about the mathematics of the the labyrinth at Chatra? Uh, some, yes. Okay, I, I won't. I won't ask any more. I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but it just fascinated me. I mean, the the vignette that I've heard is they tried to. Um, they thought they could just make a smaller version of the Chatra labyrinth, and it would be no big deal. But it required like heavy duty computer power to shrink it down. It's based on, I think, a 13 point star. And uh -huh. it's mathematically so complex, they couldn't just easily shrink it. I, I just find that fascinating. I, I think the labyrinth is 44 feet wide. When I built my own in Fairbanks, I only had 22 feet, so sort of half the size. Right. And the, and the problem is, but it's half the size, you can't walk it as well. It was very hard for me to tell where, you know. When you turn and where you turn and so on and and uh i'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later probably yeah. but there's there's a huge difference to me there's become a huge difference between walking a short labyrinth and walking the descending spiral labyrinth and i think right that's right a, it is a very big difference in, in the symbolism of it yeah i i agree i've walked all different shapes and but there's great. something very special about the about that the shot labyrinth so yeah. thank you and well, I'll have pictures of this shop labyrinth in a, in a bit of the labyrinth. So, that, that seems to be it for now. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm sort of standing uh, near where that driftwood, the, where the driftwood wall was, and looking again south. And uh, originally, the thinking was to create a, a big lake, a big pond, because one of my goals in life was if, if I could just have ducks land on the pond, it would just, I would have been successful in life. It's wonderful to have birds on, on water. So I was hoping to build this really large, probably 75 foot pond and, you know, and also you can turn in this, it's a place to swim if you do it right. But the reality was that moose punctured my pond so frequently and it was so hard to find the hole is that it was very hard to do and uh, it becomes very expensive. And anyway, so I, I realized I could not build a pond. And I was standing there one day and I thought, well, I, I could redo, I could make a labyrinth. This 
this would be a good place for a labyrinth. And you can see the pond, the pond actually, you can see the sort of, the pond was actually underneath here and it's been spread out some sense. So this was the area that I, th I thought, well, I can make a nice short labyrinth there. It'd be nice, a nice place to have one because I wasn't, I was not satisfied with what I had done before. Okay. And again, this was, this is, this was the moose problem. We get these guys, they like the water and every time they come, they uh, potentially puncture the pond. So, so this is what, so after we leveled it out, this is what we had. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's kind of flat and circular. And uh, it didn't, it didn't you know, I, I work a lot by intuition and feelings. And it, it didn't, it was out, it didn't feel right. It's, you know, it was sort of boring or something, something was not right here. So, So I thought, I said I was originally going to build, you know, the Chart Labyrinth, which is this 50 feet here. There'd be room to do to do the to do the circuits. And I thought, and I, I thought, no, I, th I think I have. What if I did a spiral? And so I so quickly sketched what I thought would be, you know, should be there some kind of spiral. This is, a, of course, this is a, the uh, actual final design. It goes the other way and there's not as many circuits. But this is the original scribble and what should you know what it should be that I showed us the cornelia and so so we dug deeper and uh you can kind of see that it's it's um you know now now there's more depth to it now you can kind of descend into it uh, all these rocks here have to be sorted and um <coughs> anyway so it's starting to develop I'm kind of laying out the patterns here but it wasn't uh it still was not deep enough. It was. It didn't. It didn't descend. I mean, I wanted to go down. I wanted to go in, in further inward. So this now. Now we're getting here. Now, so we dig down about. We dig down about four feet. And and people ask. Like, there's been when I posted stuff on Facebook. There was a lot of interest in. Well, how did you do it? So at the risk of boring the non-engineers, let me just talk about it a little bit here. So. So this, this is 40 feet across, it's 40 feet. I mean, it turned out this way. I mean, if you're a union, 40 is a pretty cool number. I mean, 40 days in the, you know, it's four and zero and wholeness and all that. And I, I was just struck by, wow, 40 feet, I think I'll keep that. So there's 40 feet between between here. On, and there's, then there's a square path around it. So there's actually, and that, which is each of them are four feet wide. So it's about 50 feet by 50 feet with, with 40 feet at the in, internal part. Um, and then, and then if you, so what I originally, what I wanted was seven, seven circuits. I wanted to be able to walk seven times. You know, I like, I like walking meditation that seemed the more I could walk, the better it would be. But if you have seven foot, seven paths, you know, they get pretty narrow. If you have essentially 20 feet to put a seven, you know, the paths in. So I realized that I needed to, you know, have wider paths. So even, I mean, potentially two people could walk together. And I also wanted plants along the side because one of the problems with previous stone labyrinth was it was very rock. It just had mostly rocks. I really wanted vegetation. So it, 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 strangely, it turned out that if you have 40 inch paths, you can have five paths. And if you drop each path if, to get down to the depth, you drop each path eight inches. So this is what these, so I made these frames. So this is, you know, these paths are, you know, 40 inches, eight inches, 40 inches, eight inches, four, and so on until you get to the center. And then with a the labyrinth, each one comes in, each one comes in um, 10 in. By the time you make a circuit, you've gone, for, you've got to go, you've got to cover 40 inches. So each one of these starts 10 inches in. So, but it's, so starting from this perimeter, you're already 20 inches in from the path. And here you would 30 inches in. So if you make these, these forms, you can sort of move them as you create the, the spiral. And I'm, I hope that makes some sense. And I would also, I also laid out all these four by fours and two by fours, eventually leveled them out so it was in, entirely level. So yeah, so the most important part in this whole engine part, and I know I am not an engineer at all. I don't, I mean, I, I really wish I had surveying another experience because we redug this several times. So the most important thing was to get, I, I knew, but I knew from this building houses, helping build houses here, that 
you really need things to be plumb level and square. That's what the carpenter kept telling me, you know, Steve, this isn't plumb, you know, you're not starting out plumb level and square. So I wanted to keep this, as make sure this is level. So one of the ways you can know whether you've got a square is that the corner to corner, say this corner you know, to, to over here is the same from, from this corner to here. And then also that you have a right angle here. So we made sure, and we must have made this five or six times. I think it's like 156 inches across. And we made sure we got it, you know, within the inch. And so each of these is, and then we made sure that it was level all the way around. You note that this was, this was hand dug. We, you know, if I've been, if I'd understood surveying more or what I was really aiming for, this all could have been taken out by a front loader, but we, we uh, had to dig this out. So once, uh, once we had it, we got the blessing of the local animal spirits. This is our, this is our local, this is our chow, Jenna and our, my son's and partner's dog, Kova. Let's see. For those not knowing, we have these, this is fireweed. This is, this is a wonderful thing that grows in Fairbanks. It's, they call it a weed, but it's, it's a beautiful flower. And these are raspberries. So you get a, so you see a little more how this was built. You see here, here's the descending, descending, and this, so this is the, this is looking uh, north, so looking south, east, uh, and west. So, so this, this is where it started. So this is right next to the path, and it's, to, it's exactly where the path starts. So it's going to come up here. That's, and at this, at this side, it's going to come in 20 inches but we're sort of starting to get the levels. And then, so finally we've got it, you know, everything sort of is a close approximation and you've got essentially the initial outline here and got, got the perimeters. This is the pond that the moose steps in and punctures. Um, <clears throat> So once we had we had it out, I started putting. I really didn't know how I was going to do this when I started. You know, I, I know I needed stones. I didn't quite know how the walls were going to be, what stones I was going to use. Uh, we got delivered. I was able to get uh, like 25 tons of river stones delivered, and uh, started laying them out and seeing how the walls would be. And I part of it so somewhere out of the blue came the idea that I should have start with smaller stones at the top and end with bigger stones at the bottom, which seems like part of what the path of the labyrinth would be. And you get a more of a sense of this. Um, you can also see that these are, what I realized was if I put big big stones at the um, corners, at, at, at the cardinal points, that it would it would kind of divide it into like a compass. So all, there are all these large stones that, you know, I got, I just sorted out the largest stones and put them in the, in the corners. Okay. This you can hear. Here's a better example of that. He, these are large granite stones, and they're, you know, this each one marks a, a different direction. Uh, this is this is what's going. You'll see later. This is what's. This is the southern wall. These are flatter stones, a little bit easier to work with. These round stones are very very difficult to work with and get connected. This is what someone in I don't know what call it a potato wall. These are rocks that are about potato size. You have to, have to stack them. It's it's uh, laborious. And this was the um, <clears throat> uh, pretty much last year in the fall, about as far as I made it last year. Again, here's the, here's the, this is the first potato wall. <clears throat> These are strawberries, and my original plan uh, was to have uh, a different every segment was to have a different uh, uh, herb or flower so that, you know, you'd walk, oh, now I'm on the strawberries part of life, or now I'm on the uh, um, dogwood, or, you know, I was trying to figure out what plants I could plant at each, in each segment. And so I planted some strawberries and dogwood and some other plants on these. Now, the problem is, in winter, you get tremendous runoff from the snow, you know, this at the bottom of a hill, so it's going to fill with water. So the question is, will the plants survive the floods? And uh, the strawberries were the only plant that survived the flood. I mean, they could be, this could be totally frozen and these, these tough little plants somehow yeah, made it through the winter. So what I decided was, um, you know, there's a wonderful philosophical questions about, um, 
uh, the turtle is, is held up on a, the world is held up on the back of a turtle. And so then the question becomes, well, what holds up the turtle? And then the answer is, well, it's turtles all the way down. So it's for, for, in this labyrinth, it's strawberries all the way down. And, and I like that idea because in the original labyrinth in, in Crete, in, in the myth, there was a golden, the thread of Adriani was the golden, it was a thread was how they found their way back out of the labyrinth. So there's a thread, a red thread of strawberries that's gonna be all the way down in the labyrinth. <clears throat> uh, I was smart enough, I mean, I, I said I'm not an engineer, but I've been on Fairbanks long enough that things need to drain. And so we put a drain in you know, before, we did, before we did most of the work, we put a drain in. And question is whether it would work, but it, it worked. Okay, this, so this was the beginning of this year. You can see, you know, this is the beginning of what I call the green wall. You slowly start putting a stuff, you've got to, you've got to sort all, you know, one of the biggest, probably most time consuming tasks in this whole thing is to sort the stones. I mean, it really helps if you lay out all the stones that you have. It's kind of like painting and getting all your paints out, but it really helps to put all the cone, stones of the same color and size together so that when you're looking for them, you can find what you need. Uh, but we also you know, we work in rain and rain does not stop the work. So this is this was the uh, you know this was this, this was the end of the summer. This was probably the hardest wall to be built. I call this the greenstone wall. This is looking uh, you know, south. Yeah, this is direct. This is south. Right here, going this way would be south. This is 20, uh, 22 feet. The problem is that these stones are. They're not flat, and so every every stone has a different has to be matched to its neighbor, you know, up and down and to the side and to the top, and so you end up moving these. You know, each stone takes seven or eight tries to get the right fit, and then you've also the, the biggest problem is you've got to fit these these very large capstones at the top and keep them level. So how do you get these stones connected to these stones to the level? So this was a problematic wall, but I was very these these uh, these granite green stones are just wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> one of the issues with the um, labyrinth, and, and I, would, when I went to sleep at night or was in a bath, I, I would think of what do I put at the center of the labyrinth? Because this seems very important. What do you what do you put at, what do you put at the center of the labyrinth? I thought, well, maybe I should have a, a fire. Or next, you know, you go there at the, at the center. There's a fire. Or I thought maybe a fountain. There should be a fountain. And I thought, well, maybe there should be a. Uh, a fountain with a fire inside it, or I should have a copper sphere, be some sort of copper sun type thing, or maybe there should be this beautiful white stone at the bottom, or maybe a large egg shaped stone, or an, maybe it should be an empty place like an Enzo, like a Zen thing. So you get there and the, you're creating out of emptiness. Or, and uh, actually, if I really had my way, this would have been you would have made it keep going here. There would have been a hole at the bottom here, you could have kept going, but that would be. Uh, beyond my expertise, so so we th we put uh, granite stones, you know these, these kind of granite stone, these black stones, these green stones, and I have these red stones around, and I, and I suddenly realize that I think I like the red stones the best because they're like the heart. These are sort of marbled muscle red stones, and so this is what uh, Devin and I did, and we'll talk show show a picture later. So. These, this is the center of the labyrinth. These are marigolds. And uh, if you put these stones upright, they're much easier to work with. So, so you get kind of a descent. The as the labyrinth descends, the stones get smaller and smaller. And you know, th this height is different than this height and so on. So, so it just worked out. I mean, I gave up on the fountain, the copper sphere, or whatever. This just seemed to be the right way to finish it. And at the center was this red, beautiful red round stones like you know this is kind of like the soul this is where this is the heart the heart of the labyrinth and and interesting to our work the actually the, the drain is right here so this under the water comes down here and it will go out at that point i'm not entirely satisfied with this i when i walk the labyrinth i really would like to have a nice high seat to sit on that com nice high comfortable seat i haven't quite figured out how to do that just as a um <clears throat> Sure, it's part of the story. So if you look at these two stones, I found this stone maybe 10 years ago. And uh, 
I, beautiful flat stone. This, we didn't cut the stone, we didn't polish the stone. This is the stone as it was found. And then five years after that, I found this stone, which is exactly, uh, if you look at this part right here, it matches this stone, this right here. So if you flip the stone and put it on top here, it's the same stone exactly in half, it's flat. It's just, I was just amazed that this, that this was there, the kind of stone was meant to be there. So this stone here, uh, came, th uh, this is one of the original sort of entrance to the, uh, I really, I mean, this is a, almost a perfectly round red stone. It's volcanic. Uh, it's, it was at the entrance to the labyrinth, to the stone sanctuary, and I kind of borrowed it, at least for now, to put it at the center, to put, uh, whoops. Oops, I'm getting, it's, it's very hard to see where the, uh, sorry, this, this is keeping it. Yeah, so that's that's the stone there. Okay. So th this is the green wall that was completed, and then I call this the uh, this is the forever wall. Uh, this is looking south, and I, I call it forever wall because it seemed it seemed to take forever to do. I mean, it, it started last summer, summer, and uh, really the summer before last. You know, it's, the whole the whole project is one stone at a time, and one stone at a time. When they're small stones, uh, can be very, very uh, time-consuming. It also is looking, um, as you can tell, the sun is behind it. Uh, this as I said south is the primo view in, in place in Fairbanks that really changes things. In the middle of at the lowest point in winter here, at uh, December twenty-first, the the, the, the um, sun is one thumb above the horizon. Two degrees above the horizon. So this is uh, this isn't high noon, but this would this would be high noon uh, <laughs> very soon. So anyway, this direction is very important. This is the south. Uh, this is uh, more completed. Again, you see the you see the this is the wall we are talking about here. This is the green oh, This is the greenstone wall. This is some apple tree that just grew up faster than all the other apple trees around. You can see, originally, you know, I think the labyrinth was going to be here, but this changed. It seemed to me that the best place to enter it was right, you know, was right here. So you know, things change, and this, this is the, you know, here you can see the strawberries here. We've got most, we got strawberries much of the way down. Okay. We also uh, build fires. Fires help a lot for mood and morale and warmth and so there have been fires in the corners these actually will be probably small like the burning man's thing you saw from the other things these are probably going to be small little uh fire features so when there's a an important ritual you can have a fire that goes with it there's one here these are these are the flat stones i was talking about that match each other these are, this is the cardinal points these are the large stones going up this way this is the these are black stones each of these segments, this is meant to be, so there, you can't see it here. They're red, they're red stones here. This is going to be a white stone wall, green stone, and this is the negredo. This is a black stone wall. So all these, you know, when they're wet, this is just this very scary, wonderful black. And here, I don't have it. This is for few previews of coming attractions is the, is the pond. It's in the shape of infinity. It's the pond of infinity. and uh, of black stones that the water is going to flow out of. So let's get a picture and you can see these, these are leftover green stones and the white stones for the coming wall. You know, there's still st the stones everywhere. It's not finished. This was a, um, I'll talk about it. This is a five-year project. This is the third year of, of it. Um, you can just get a sense of this is the, again, this is the Southern wall. You get a sense of these large capstones there and then we have, so we have the fires and this is just this is the rock with some other rocks on top of it and there's the green wall there so this was that this was taken at a uh, if you're in Fairbanks you could be a member of the CGM Society of Northern Alaska and we had our equinox gathering there so it's really fun nice nice place it's really it, it, one of the things I've done here is um, Sunday afternoon some three to five Anyone as well could come by and walk the labyrinth and talk. And it's been wonderful to have just conversations with people, just sitting at the labyrinth and talking and 
people in a different kind of a framework. It's a really nice, it's a very mellowing place to be. Now, this is the um, uh, red wall. These are red, reddish stones. This is the last project of, this, of, the, of the winter. Uh, this is the direction of Russia. This is the direction to the, to the west. Um, and these are these walls are 50, this is 50 feet long by the 50 feet long by two feet high. So so this wall is two feet. And you go down when you walk the labyrinth, the labyrinth descends four feet. So if you follow the math here, when you're at the bottom of the labyrinth, you're six feet under. Now, when I realized that, it just it cracked me up. I thought, well, that's fitting because you know, when you learn part of the spiral is about it's about life and death. It's about the spiral, you know, death spiral, you know, the beginning of life, uh, the beginning of death. Um, so one more, a couple more pictures and then some questions. So, you know, when it comes always too soon to Fairbanks, we actually got a little delayed just it was three weeks later than last year, but there's never enough time. You want to, I wanted to finish this wall before winter for some reason, and you get a sense of what it, you know, what it takes to finish the wall here. These are, you know, these are the, these are the stones sort of pancake stones I'm using, some of the largest stones. Leveling is leveling the stones is a real issue. Uh, that's what takes the most time to get, you've got to, you've got to fit these together and you've got to level them. It's not quite finished here. And so, you, and so you have to keep moving the stones around and replacing them and seeing what, uh, what fits together. And, and interestingly, as an intuitive type, you know, I kind of miss uh, the outside world sometimes. And level is level is important. And I would I would put four or five or ten or twenty stones down, and and then I said, well, maybe I should see if they're level. Uh, they were not level because you know from when you're close up, you get too into it, and you can't really see where. I mean, you think you're level, but you're not. So it really helps to have an external source that I kept having over and over to learn I needed to do. And the other trick, I mean, one has to do is. You put in a couple of stones, you need to step back and see what you've done. Because I've, I've done work for 30 minutes, forgot to step back, and I step back, and there are all sorts of problems with it. So it's a real lesson in reality, too, to work with stones. So this, yeah, I think this questions are coming up. So again, this is, this, is the, this is the final wall. This is the red wall. This is towards Russia. This is towards Hawaii. This is towards Canada. And this is towards the North Pole. There are these portals. You can see these large stones, the portals, stairs at the side of the, of the portals to the place. This is going to be uh, kind of a patio place to be. So I think that's, oh, this, so this is getting a perspective on things. My son has an aerial drone and we took this. Again, here's, here's the entrance. Yeah, the entrance is up here. This is going to be the Pool of Infinity. You can see the, there's a bridge here over the Pool of Infinity. You walk the labyrinth. So I think the labyrinth is about 400 feet walking. And again, you see, you can see the here. You can see the cardinals, the stones that outline the, you know, the, the directions. Okay. Strawberries and the marigolds, the center. And again, lots of stones that are. This must have been taken. This was taken before. You can see all the see all the stones on the ground here. This wall was not finished. These stones were laid out. And. Uh, had some young people help me lay, put them out, and uh, then then you well, put it, you know uh, get them set. Okay. And again, so this is a reminder. This is so this is this was the process. This is the building of the labyrinth. And this is we'll end this section here. Um, uh, just just to so get a setting. So this is Fairbanks. This is Fairbanks in this direction. This is the Tanana. I think you can barely see the Tanana River here. That's our large river here. Again, looking south is looking towards the. Hawaii and Seattle direction. Uh, we live in a birch forest. We are at 900 feet. Fairbanks is about 400 feet, so we're like you know, 500 feet higher. Most, mostly birch trees here, some aspen trees, some black spruce trees, and some larch trees. So I think it's, oh, let me see. I, I had some helpers with this. This is Gabe. Uh, we work in any weather. We, we had what we called Gabe stones. Gabe stones are stones that are too big for me to lift, and he would say, would say Gabe would be able to lift them. So Gabe was very helpful. This is Devin. Devin was uh, <clears throat> it kind of made me think that they were 
talk about hidden hands. It's like I was sent a guardian angel. Uh, she worked for two and a half summers. Uh, she, uh, we were talking about, about this and she said, uh, in, in preparation for the talk, and she said that um, her intention was to bring gentleness and healing to the sanctuary, as they certainly did. So certainly, it's certainly been one of the best parts of the labyrinth is just that working with these people. So, okay, a blank slide means it's time for questions. The next part is going to be about the symbolism of those things. This is sort of the uh, the more a more a little more abstract. This is more of the down to earth stone part. Rich Boone was going to ask a question if he's around at this point. Not he, if Rich is there. If Rich raises his hand, he may be there. Um, let's see. Anyone, anyone else is welcome to comment or question. Oh, Rich Boone's got his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Hey, I'm here, Steve. Okay. Your video is your video on. Home is where the Mac is. <sighs> okay. Well, what? So, Rich, you've had experience in walking the labyrinth and seeing it. What, what was your experience of it? it? You know, I pause when I think of the question and my answer because it's hard to describe. Um, it, it's revealing uh, internally. Um, I think a really key aspect of the labyrinth is the fact that it goes lower as you go around the labyrinth and you decline to go lower in depth and elevation. I remember when I started it, I was nervous, but also kind of excited in a way. And what I've experienced as I walked the labyrinth is I felt that I was walking physically through the history of my life. And when I got to the bottom, I mean, the flat stones are perfect, I think, because in the fact that it's lower is perfect because it allows you to see, for me at least, my life represented physically um, by, the, by the labyrinth itself from the bottom to the top. And so I, I found it revealing, um, settling, centering. And the other aspect that I thought was really exciting was that, of course, you have to exit the labyrinth at some point and as you do, for me, I felt like I was walking through my life from its start to where I am currently. And the thing that was exciting is that at the end, you know, there are still rocks ahead of you that haven't been placed yet. There's still a future there that you haven't seen. And so it's also, in a way, liberating to get to the end of the labyrinth on the exit. So it's, I think it's a privilege to, to walk the labyrinth and to see it. Well spoken, Rich. Uh, two, okay. More questions. Lisa Fladig Fladiger, Fladiger, Fladiger. That was good. <laughs> well done, uh, Steve. This is just. I'm so blown away. I feel so activated in um, hearing your story and talking about your process. Um, it really resonates with um, a process that I went through myself in healing from trauma, um, in uh, partnering with psyche and, um, and objects in nature. And there's something that just happens. This is what I'm hearing and, and experiencing and being reminded of again, as I'm hearing you talk about how all this came into being, how your intuition was alive, and yet you had to be in your sensation function to execute all of this. And um, the synchronicities of particular stones and how they presented themselves to you and how things came into place, but it's not like they did them by themselves. You had to be involved with the making of it and then also what you said about um you needed to exteriorize what was inside of you and by in exteriorizing what was inside of you and seeing it outside of you then you could change something in yourself i might might be extending that a little too much there but um that was that was um my impression and um I just 
reminded of what Jung wrote about to the extent that he was able to find the image and the emotion, he was calmed and um, he felt something, he felt put right. And this is how it seems to me as I'm hearing you talk and, and it's really resonating uh, for me a lot. And I'm also realizing that um, this is, this is like, this is an, an archetypal pattern to heal in this way. And um, like what you did was very specific and particular to you and your process was extremely specific and particular. And in my healing process, it was extremely specific and particular to me. But this being able to follow something that comes alive inside and gets exteriorized and then we are changed by it um, just wow um, I can feel that moving in me as I'm listening to your your story thank you well thank you Lisa one of the rights came across was you know there's a statement that well there's a will there's a way and the union way more is you know where there's a way there's a will and i think that's you know and i read that that resonated with me that it's not i didn't do this because wow i gotta put these rocks together and and make something it was like this needs to be done so i'll have i have the will to do it and it was more it really is one of being of service to the psyche and service to the soul and not of some something i thought i should be doing and something that spoke for itself or you know, said it should happen yes like a a, a you just you followed you, you followed a sort of a pathless path, but then the a path would appear and then you would step onto it. Yeah, it, it's almost made me believe in union stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, this, that's really, there might be something to this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? We got about a half hour left here, so start a little late. I think that's it. Good. Okay. So now we're talking about, I'm going to read some quotes and, you know, why stones of, of all the things in the world, why, you know, why stones? And uh, most of the stuff you were in, in uh, uh, Man and His Symbols, this, these, most of these quotes, quotes come from Man and His Symbols, but he, it's very, you know, he's 82 years old. He's writing this book. He's really, he's, he's kind of honed it down. He knows what he needs to say. And he says it very cleanly. Uh, the stone symbolizes something permanent that can never be lost. It's something eternal that men have compared to the mythical spirits of God of God within one's soul. So, you know, it's, it's the idea that's so hard to comprehend. It, it's not the stones. We are we have something within us, and we give it to the stones. We have an, we have a mystery, a God, or some soul, and we we think it's the stones that have it. These are these are stones. They, I, I hate to say they're just stones, but they're stones. It's, it's something from us that is going out there, something from within that you think is in the stone. Let's see, I don't know how to get this written in here. I think I'll let you read, I'll just let you read this stuff. And um, the, the gallery is blocking my, I will not do the quote right because right now the gallery is blocking it. For, your pictures are over the quote. But let me, um, whoops, too far ahead here. Whoa. Jumped ahead there. Just a minute here. Okay. So the idea, so you know, there's the idea of unhewn, there's a difference between unhewn and hewn stones too. You know, these are stones, you don't chip away these stones. You, these just stones, you leave stones as they are. And pretty much my theory and, and what I built was I didn't, no stones were hurt. I did not take, I, I did not, you know, break up stones so that they would fit. I, you know, the stones were of themselves and they needed to fit. You know, I needed to find the stones that would fit rather than to make them fit. So this is the idea that people cannot just refrain from picking up stones. You know, lots, lots and lots of people, I'm sure there are many among you who just, you know, you go to a beach and, and you got to pick up the stones because you think there's something really special about the stones. And, uh, you know, the problem is if you have a pickup truck, you're just going to get more, more and more stones. So there is a, uh, 
museum in Japan is a museum of stone faces. All, they're like 2,000 stones, and they all look like faces in some way or another. So this is this is this is one of the. I mean, this 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 is a stone, folks. This isn't. A, I mean, no one carved this. It's just so you know. We sort of project on. Oh, this must be a human stone, but it's just really the. Not just really, but it's it just happened that way. Okay, so there's some we project some kind of life force onto the stones. That's within us. So very early in history, men began to express what they felt to be the soul and spirit of stone by working into a recognizable form. So the animation of the stone is, 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 is again, it's the projection from something in its exteriorization of the psyche onto these inanimate objects. And I love these, you know, these these stones in uh, Easter Island are just just fascinating. These are done, I think, 13th, 15th century or so on, something like that. The 887 of these that were um, done. And each stone allegedly, I don't know how they know this, each stone took um, four to five men a year uh, to work with stone. So people are willing to spend a long time with stone projects. If you think about Stonehenge, I mean, why, what is it that makes people move stones 150 miles to build big things in the air. I mean, there's something about, you know, the, that you're doing that's, that's coming from within. And this is what's underneath the, the, the stones. Now I saw this, this cracked me up when I saw it, it sort of rose. And I thought, well, that's pretty funny. And then a year later, this is actually, this, there actually is an unconscious to these stones. I mean, there's more to the stones than the head, but, but over time they were, they were buried. So we're, we're more there, so. So you estimate, so each person is five, six feet, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 35 feet, 40 feet high, 40 feet. That's what they are, probably 40 feet. So this is a stone from um, uh, the Aborigines. This is one of my favorite images of a stone I've seen. I mean, there's spirals here. I mean, this is, imagine the, the, the owner of this stone must have been really pleased or he must have had some kind of power this is they carved this into a flat stone. I and mean, this is very, very ancient. Uh, this is another one. This again, uh, this is one of my favorite stones. It's, these are kangaroo tracks all around the center. There's the wheel of life, the circle of life. So this is the Rhine Falls in Switzerland. And Jung grew up here. As a, even he was a young kid, this is where he was. And he talks about. <clears throat> Uh, so, so at the age of 10, he carves a, a, a little mannequin out of uh, wood. And then in the, in the box of this, he, play, he, he makes a stone that's divided into black and white. And he puts, you know, and he puts it with this. And it's, he said, this was his stone. This is a great secret. So this is, this is the soul. You know, we talked about the soul stone of, of the Aborigines. This is, Jung's, this is where Jung picked this up. Like as a kid, he, the stone he projected, you know, this, this is his soul that he was putting in his pocket. Now. You know, this is the Rhine. This is actually, believe it or not, this is where rhinestones actually originally came from. Rhinestones were quartz made from this river, and then they got more into just fancy plastic. But actually, it's funny that rhinestones are from near where uh, Jung was. He had an accident on his bridge when he was three and a half or four. He almost slipped into the river, and his uh, caretaker just pulled him up. He thought he had sort of a, you know, he said his unconscious was not ready for life. Uh, so we're now going to talk about Bollingen. Again, there's, you can see there are lots of spirals near Bollingen. This is the sense of place is important. This is uh, uh, Kushnacht. This is where Jung's house was that he built. Now, he married the second richest woman in Switzerland. They built a nice house on the lake. But then he, you know, when his um, mother died in 1925, he started Bollingen, which is about 20 miles, about 20 miles uh, from his uh, house. house. And this was his favorite place to be, of course. This is where he found solitude. He said if he, he would, he didn't really want to come back for life, but if he could live at Bowling again, he would come back because he really was, that's where his soul was. His soul was there. So he built this, um, this was his first hut that he built. He said words and prayer did not seem enough. So his words were, I, ha I had to make a confession of faith in stone. So there's something about stone that makes you think, you know, uh, that's permanent, that's important. And this is what he's doing now. Now Jung did not do all this work himself. He was, you know, he helped the masons. There was a quarry across the lake where he got the stones from. This is the first structure he built. 
Then he built the second, about two years later, he built this. And oh, I, I'd say that you know, on this one, someone pointed out, this is the only entrance and exit. This is not according to code. You can't build something without an exit in case there's a fire. So he was not, I mean, this is like Alaska. He's not building the code. But I don't think he asked anybody. I doubt he asked someone if he could do that. Okay, the second house, the family house, much more, you know, this had more electricity, had more water. Let's see here. Everyone who goes to Zurich, you know, and Jung things tends to go, tends to want to go see this uh, bowling game. Okay, so the second phase of the house built in 1997, this is by his biographer, Deidre Baer, begins to resemble more of a family house. When a two-story wing was added to the Lone Tower, the house now opened more itself to the lake, aligning roughly in the afternoon. So this is, you know, this is a very large addition to it. Okay, then it gets bigger. Now this this is a complete thing. This is the final. This is the first one, second one here. I think the third. This is the fourth or fifth. So this is the this is what he built after his wife his wife died. And you have to quote it. again. It's, the, 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 I'm partly talking about this because it's an exterioration of the psyche. It's, it's what's going on within that hasn't built uh, without. And that, you know. And, okay, he said. <clears throat> Oh, actually, there's a picture. I think there's a layout. This is just another view of it. That's the entrance. There's an outhouse here. I have not yet, like Cornelia said, there's an outhouse. She, she felt, I mean, people use. Nobody talks about it. There's no pictures of it, but it's it's here. And it's somewhere somewhere in this area. This I think that's the stone. That's the stone before it had the cover on it. So these are, these are the four phases. So this is phase one, two, three, four, five. He said, this is the fifth stage. So this is what he put finally here. He said, after my wife's death, I felt an inner obligation to become what I, I myself am. To put it in the language of the Bolingen house, I suddenly realized that the small central section which crouched so low, so hidden was myself. I could no longer hide myself behind the maternal and spiritual towers. So in that same year, I added an upper story to the section, which represents myself or my ego personality. Earlier, I would not have been able to do this. I would have regarded it as presumptuous and self of the presumptuous self-emphasis. Now it signified an extension of consciousness. Okay, so when Jung is 75, he carves a stone. He starts carving this stone. Now this is, the famous story with this is that, you know, 30, when he was first building it, his, his uh, structures, he ordered a triangular stone and the, and the um, masons brought the long, wrong stone. He said, that's not what I ordered. He said, well, we'll take it back. He said, no, no. That's my stone. I must have it. He didn't know why. So 30 years later, or even more, he's 75 and he starts carving things in this square stone that was there, that was left by mistake. And this is part of his whole, the whole union approach to wholeness is the acceptance of the rejected part. So he's carving this in stone at, at 75. So of, of all the things that probably inspired me to build this labyrinth, you know, I'm turning 75 in a couple of years, and I thought, you know, um, I'll, I'll get that quote in a minute here. So, so I think as Maud, Maud Oaks, who's an anthropologist, worked with Jung, Jung apparently told her, he said, I need not have written any books. It's all there in the stone. I thought, holy cow, you mean, I, mean, I didn't have to read those things. I could just look at the stone. Here's this guy who who writes 18 collected works, has written all this, and he says, I need not have written anything. What I have to set is all in that stone. And so what's in that stone is very, very important. I mean, that, that's sort of the summation of his life. And I, and I must say, I was thinking, well, everything I have to say is in, is in that spiral labyrinth. It's about, it's about it's, maybe it's the map of the movie. But, you know, it's the spiral, it's the way of life. And so that, that was a very, you know, that was the inspirational part. And... Um, I need not have written any books. It's all there. It's all on the stone. And this is what this is what this stone says. And um, time is like a child, and so on. Notice that notice the, rec, the talking about stars, and this is like an eye with an iris. Um, uh, 
Now, I think the top and the on on the um, one of the other sides it says, <clears throat> "Here stands the mean uncomely stone. It is very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise." So again, it's those basic rejected elements within that give us wholeness. Okay. Ah, questions. And then we got one final. Anybody raise your hand, use the raise hand. Guess not. If you're happy and you know it, raise your hand. <laughs> I think that was a very profound section that people are pondering. Uh -huh. Well, there's more to there's more to ponder yet. Wow. Okay, there are never the final one. So, <clears throat> much of the red. Oh, Catherine, Catherine, to pick on Catherine. Yeah. I think she's un unmuted. Um, wait a sec. Oh, I closed that off. Okay, Catherine, go ahead. Catherine, yeah, this time, yeah. Steve, how is your eye of Horace? <laughs> it's gonna. It's, it's that's for folks. What I didn't put in time before I finished the labyrinth, I decided I had to make this eye out of stone. So that's really next. We'll talk about that next year. But it, it's a. Uh, it was an interesting development. But before I had to could finish the labyrinth, I had to create an eye, which is about consciousness and awareness. Okay, thank so you. If people, if people want to see you can go to face, the Facebook thing has yeah. a dialogue about that. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Catherine. Good to meet you too. <laughs> yes, I mean we should tell people that you have a Facebook page where a lot of these things get. Well, I'll, 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 paste, I'll post a link at the end. Yeah. Good. So, so much of the Red Book was about Jung's search for the soul. It might as well have been, you know, you know might. Uh, man trying to find his soul and this is what it's about remember that movie that, you know this is the petrified forest the man wandering into the desert trying to find his soul and i think that speaks you know our own journey it's both our own and the journey of the, of the time of our that we're in and so that this is a time when people are looking for soul and i think that's the appeal pull of the labyrinth and all this stuff it's we're trying to find you know a soul and and and, and, and there is one there is one to find and that's what I mean, that's sort of the message I hope to convey here. So Jung said to find their soul, the ancients went to the desert, again, in petrified forest, that's where he was. He was in a desert. You know, the, 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 is, and the desert is a reflection of the psyche too. There's, there's nothing growing there for the most part. It's just dry. It needs water. It needs growth. Okay. My soul leads me into the desert. You know, the desert of my own soul. So at the time when he was writing the Red Book, he was very, he was very lost. And he couldn't, you know, his, his father was a pastor who didn't believe in God. And this was part of his, his, his search. Again, he, was, who, he whose desire turns away from outer things reaches a place of the soul. William Blake is a great illustrator of soul stuff. I mean, he's got a sen sense of this. So you have to, to find your soul. And that's when you go to the desert, you, you, you take away the stimulation of the outside world. You, ha you have to go within. And in fact, that's part of the blessing and the curse of Alaska, particularly with the winners, you can't, there's nothing, you have to go in, inward here to deal with it. Uh, the, the pandemic did that for lots of people. You start, you can't, you can't travel, you can't go to restaurants, but maybe I'll, I'll have to be quiet and go within. I had to realize that I am only the soul, some symbol and expression of my soul. This is my favorite drawing in the Red Book. For those who haven't seen the Red Book, you got to see it. It's beautiful illustrations. I love this little dragon. I'm looking. This is sort of like the unconscious looking at you. Better be careful, they're dragons. My soul is my supreme being, my image of God. Again, this is Blake, that circle here. Jung said this, uh, the soul is an intelligence independent of space and time. Now this is very radical. Um, it's not what the current culture 
things at all. If there's some intelligence, there is some kind of intelligence out there. And this isn't necessarily the God that uh, watches over us and protects us, but there's some, there is some kind of uh, intelligence there, out there. There's some, you know, it's the collective unconscious in Jung's term. This is the pillar, the, the image on the left is the pillars of creation by the Webb telescope. It's kind of amazing. This is, this is the uh, Cathedral in Chart, 12th to 13th century, 11 circuits. They went here. The idea was that uh, the pilgrims could go there rather than walk into Jerusalem. They could follow the spiritual path in the church. Of course, they often did it on their, crawling on their hands and knees. But this, you know, then, they, then there, there are all these chairs that were covered it. And they had to rediscover this in the 80s. But this is where pilgrims go to sort of walk the walk. Ah, this is uh, Lauren Archeris, whoops, who had, she's the one who really brought the um, labyrinth to Grace Cathedral and brought it to all, you know, to the country here. It's an archetype of wholeness. The, the, the idea is that there, is, that there is a center, there is a place, if you go there, you can, it, it's there. Something is there at the center. This is the one in, uh, in Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. When she wrote, when she, um, Lauren Archeris goes to, uh, has, goes to a uh, Houston workshop on a, on a mystery school and uh, she walks the labyrinth there and she thought, well, this is really something. I got to go to Shark. So she goes, the, she goes to Chartres. She walks and she has a profound experience. She's greatly affected by it. She says, I wonder what I'll dream. And she dreams she has a heart attack. <laughs> and the idea, she said, well, you know, it's like, it changed my life, you know, the old life died or something, and I had a new heart or something coming. This is sort of reverse of my story. Anyway, so connected with the ancient symbol for the divine mother, the god within, the goddess creation. So part of the part of the search for me, and I think part of the search for the culture and for many men is to find the feminine within, you know, to find to find you know, the, the to find the feminine. But it's also the it's also the task of the culture. In the correct time room. This is a Sydney labyrinth. Uh, this is this is clearly a message that if you walk a labyrinth, you can get all your ducks in a row. So so um, Emily Simpson, who I've talked to, is a friend from Facebook and kind of a friend anyway, outside of Facebook. Um, so her story was in 2009. She goes uh, on a trip and, and meets someone and says, "Well." If you, if you come to San Francisco, you gotta walk this labyrinth. This is 2009. And so she walks the labyrinth. And uh, so I felt reeled in by its mystery and held by the structure of its winding path. I'd been in an emotional cocoon after a series of losses and leavings and somehow walking the labyrinth lifted a grief off, off my shoulders and gave me back a spiritual pulse. When I got back home from San Francisco, I went looking for a labyrinth to walk here in Sydney and realizing there wasn't any. So Emily, introverted Emily, it help you know makes this labyrinth happen. So it's the center of uh, center of uh, Sydney. Really amazing thing. Again, a quote from Lauren here. This is uh, this is photoshopped, of course, but I think you would have walked Labyrinth City at some point anyway. And this is at least qualifies as active imagination. Uh, the, the, you know, the original labyrinth story is that there's a minotaur at the, at the center of a labyrinth and that must be slain. And one of the differences between a labyrinth and a, and a maze, and it's not in all languages, but a maze is, is, is a, is a multi-branching course with sort of a mystery or a puzzle, and you don't know how you can get in or how you can get, at, get out. This is what the one in Crete was. In a labyrinth, it's one way, there's one path that you follow in and out. So I didn't really want to get into this myth. I think it's, much, it's a different myth. Here. It's a diff of, of, you know, it's not getting lost in a maze. It's just find it's following a direct path. So one of the things that labyrinths do is one of the things missing in our culture is a place for ritual and ceremony. And uh, I, I wanted a, a place like this at, uh, near me. So this is part it came, it came to fruition this uh, September. It's a wonderful place for ceremony. I guess go through some slides here. I won't spend too much. This is uh, 
actually from the area where Ukraine is now. It's about 4,000 years ago. Tattoos, I think it's just beautiful. Arizona. Arizona. People make cultures throughout the world, throughout time, and this, you know, made this primitive early cultures, Neolithic cultures, made this, made this symbol. This is Malta 3000. These are toey balls from Scotland, 3,000. This to me is one of the most remarkable objects ever. I mean, this is to carve this 5,000 years ago with this intricacy of this depth is just amazing that they still don't know what it was used for. Um, I think it's some kind of magic. Whoever had this was the magician of the time. This is at New Grange. See these beautiful, beautiful spirals. They, they're associated with death. This is a, you know, the dolmens. This is where people were buried. So there's some life and death thing about the spirals. And this is a spiral that I, that was talking about spiral. So I'm uh, a friend of mine says, see, your work reminds me of Arthur Dove. It was an America's first abstract painter. 1934, he did this image. This is where the spiral goes. It's going this way. It's going clockwise. He did this three years before his heart attack. So there's some there's something going on here. I, 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 she told me I saw this. I was floored when I saw this. And then I go visit my family in D.C., and I walk into the Phillips Gallery, and there is this painting. It, it, it knocked me to the floor back of it. I sat and cried and looked at it. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend it, really, that it was there, that it was real. But it was a very similar journey. This is uh, Remedio Sparo. She was you know, a surrealistic painter in Mexico. This was her last painting. It's called Still Life Revival. She painted, this is the only painting she did without people. She did this, she died several months after this. This was she died of a heart attack. So there's something about there's some there's something going on here, you know, with spirals and heart and so on. Okay. So spirals are also a mandala. I mean, this I was trying to understand the symbolism here. I started understanding that this really was about more than the labyrinth. It was about a mandala. And Jung, um, you know, Jung was the one who coined the term. He, you know, he took it from Sanskrit, but he's the one that brought it back into the language. So labyrinth, the spiral labyrinth is also a mandala. It's about a symbol of wholeness, a divinity within. Again, look, look at the star that he's putting here. Okay. The star symbol, this is what we're going to get to. Okay. Again, this is this is from the Red Book. You move spiralize around the center where you get more and more towards the center, you get more and more towards the soul. So Van Gogh, this is probably the most famous painting of our time, spirals. I, I you know, I saw this at the uh, in New York, the Modern Gallery Museum of Modern Art. I thought it was like six feet by four feet and I went to check it's only three feet by two feet. It, it sure looked big to me when I saw it. So there's something very archetypally big about this picture. And, and only, I mean, it's only three by four of them. That's still a big painting. So Jung talks about a dream of having a bluish diamond like high in heaven, reflected in a quiet round pool. This is to the Protestant minister. So the correspondence, his correspondence is now available. So, so watch for the star. So this is the star. This is the soul. The symbol of the star is falling down, has the eternal meaning of the soul of man descending. So at the center, at the center of the labyrinth it, 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 I, is the soul. Now this is a meteorite. If I had I would love to place a meteorite at the center of the labyrinth. This is, you know, this is worshipped in the old times like some rock from heaven. So, and, and amazing, it's amazing this, this meteorite just landed right in the center of this spiral. Um, they built, this is in Namibia in uh, Africa, the largest meteorite around. And the center, the black stone is the center of this Islamic faith too. It's a meteorite. Okay, the Kundalini, the, you know, the, Part of the feminine image here is that of Kundalini, or the energy at the base of the spine. So it's again, it's the feminine force. He says it's a totally, it's a world of eternity. And of course, the world of eternity is the world of the collective unconscious. So this, 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 this story quote also floored me when I read it. Jung says, I failed in my foremost task to open people's eyes to the fact that man has a soul and that there's a buried treasure in the field. So Jung failed, he failed in life. This guy, again, he wrote 18 collected works, brilliant life that he failed. He failed because he hadn't convinced us that there was indeed a soul. Maybe there is, folks. Archetypes are images of the soul that represent the course of one's life. 
Uh, so this is a, this is a getting this is a getting a perspective on things. We're just about to finish here. This is a labyrinth in Fairbanks. This is where this is where we are in the Milky Way. We're kind of at the edge of things. This is a spiral. The spiral here at the edge. And this is where the Milky Way is. is a, this is a picture from uh, about 100,000 100, most local galaxies near us. This is not the whole universe. This is just 100,000 nearest us. A picture of where we are in this huge place. And it kind of looks to me like a heart. These are like the arteries of the heart. I think that's a good place to stop. Questions, comments? While, while we're waiting to raise, oh, there's somebody, Lisa again. Um, okay, go ahead, Lisa. Hi, Steve. Um, do you know there's there have been lots of studies about the heart as a spiral that the heart yes. is a du double spiral? I don't yes. know if you. Yes, the heart is a. Yes, the heart is not a pump. The heart is a vortex. It's like this. When you ring it a tablet, it goes like this. Yes, the heart is like DNA. It's like a spiral. I meant to put that. Yeah, in. a helical kind of double spiral. Yes. Yeah, and embryologically, there are, there are videos you can see of the the development of the heart and how it how it really is a spiral. So I. Yeah. So again, that would fit in with I'm I'm doing exteriorization of the psyche. So I'm sort of. You know, creating a wall is creating a spiral, you know, maybe right. Maybe if I finish this, I could stop my AFib, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess I, I just put those two together. Um, I, I just remembered that as after your, your presentation today. And, um, there you go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next we have Hunter. This will just be a comment. Uh, it's a great lecture, and the thing about uh, our solar system that early in the 60s, when I was going to school, basically said the nine planets, and we'll just leave it at nine planets, orbiting the sun was viewed like top view, just circling the sun. But in three-dimensional reality, it uh, is like um, if the sun is here and we have different planets orbiting at different speeds as they get obviously sl slower in uh, revolutions of the sun as they get farther out. But the, in re reality is the sun is traveling and the planets are circling, so they become vortexual spirals. And if you view them from the side, um, that model of spiraling is a bunch of sine waves. So that's sort of tied into our, uh, you know, viewpoint of the world. And aside from that, if you, I've been studying, you know, anti gravity propulsion craft, the way that it, it actually travels is, is if you have a, um, the typical saucer, it, it doesn't travel linearly, but it creates a vortex of very high voltage that spirals up. And the opposite helix is very high magnetism. And that focal point is able to bend the time and space fabric around the craft and travel as if a bow of a ship is traveling through water. So that to me is another interesting spiral of, you know, time, space, sound, and light. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, but it's, it is also how we view things uh, psychically, right? you know, towards our own soul. One of the things I was meditated on was on I was at the beach. At the beach, you know, there there are allegedly more stars in the universe than are grains of sand in beach in beaches and grains of sand on planet Earth, which is just you know I was on this beach and it seemed like a lot of sand to me, and it's just beyond conception to me that there are more stars than sand. How, how can this possibly be? You know, so it's 
we're pretty little people out there and anyway it's quite mysterious it's quite right mysterious. yeah we're all connected <laughs> mitra oh. has it Next, we have Mitra, but um, if it's all right with you, Stephen, while she's talking, I'm going to share screen. I'm going to show your uh, Facebook page, okay? Sure. In fact, I've got here. I'll uh, sure. Let me. I have a. There, there, this is the way you can connect okay. with me. Okay. Find me. It's pretty easy. Steve sixty four North. That's the parallel Fairbanks of that. Steve sixty four North at gmail .com. I also run Yung Currents. I'm at Facebook at Yung dot Harvard. Okay. They can, that you can. Um, yeah, you should look for Steve Park on Facebook and I'll show up. There are so also, go ahead. Uh, no, you, you finished, sorry. No, that's fine, whoops. Anyway. Okay, so Mitra, go ahead. Oh uh, Yes, hi, thanks so much for uh, sharing this lovely journey towards the labyrinth with us, Steve. And uh, I just wanted to tell everyone who lives in Orange County, our friends who uh, live in Orange County, that there is a, beautiful labyrinth right uh, in our neighborhood at the um, unity of Tustin. Uh, there is a, an interfaith mystic garden and it's fabulous. If you ever get a chance to uh, visit there, you wouldn't regret it. It's really beautiful. And again, thanks so much for an interesting topic and um, your private journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Yes, that's probably it. So, um, I guess that's it. That's a nice, nice place to end. And I actually hear my daughter knocking on the door, wanting me to join the Halloween party that's going on in my house. Are you so wearing I, a costume, Judy? Are you going to be wearing a costume? Oh, you yes, are. I, have, I will put on my uh, fire chief hat. And I will go join the party. And thank you so much, Stephen. This was really, really wonderful and beautiful, beautiful images and lots to lots to ponder. So thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. And we hope to see you all in uh, November to talk about Kali with Michael Marsman. And happy Halloween, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.